Um, and I do, I want to start by, um, by thanking all of you for, for coming inside on this, the last October nature program series of, uh, you know, of the year. Um, Monday starts November. So thank you all for, for joining us. We are very excited about this program. Um, before I get things going, I want to first take a moment to thank Tin Mountains Nature Program Series sponsors. Those are Hancock Lumber, White Mountain Oil and Propane, and Ragged Mountain Equipment. Um, I want to thank them for their continued support. I also want to thank all of you watching who are current members of Tin Mountain Conservation Center. Um, your membership dollars also go towards helping us to fulfill our mission and to bring these type of programs forward. So thank you all who are members. If you're not currently a member of Tin Mountain, I would encourage you to consider doing so. And if membership isn't the right thing for you right now, um, right on our website in the same place where we have membership information, okay top right corner um, where it says support us. There's also an option just to donate directly right. to the nature program series. And that also helps us um, to continue these programs. Um, we do have, I know a number of uh, several of you, we were talking about this. Several of you are signed up for um, the optional field program that's scheduled for Saturday morning. Uh, David and I were just talking <laughs> keeping an eye on the weather. Um, Saturday's weather is not looking very promising. Um, we'll make a decision about whether that program will go forward. Um, we'll make that decision by tomorrow afternoon um, so that folks can plan accordingly and hopefully we'll be able to reschedule that if that's not the case. Um, coming up, we do have next a couple of interesting programs as well. Um, we did have to postpone um, due to um, an issue with our presenter, um, had to postpone the bird migration, um, the visual exploration uh, that was scheduled for November 4th, next Thursday. Um, so we will be looking to reschedule that. Um, but we do on Friday evening, we have a field program that is um, Saturn, uh, a stars and Saturn astronomy program up at the field station in Jackson. So that's uh, Friday night, as long as uh, the skies are clear. And then on Saturday, uh, for a good part of the day, we're very excited. Um, we have a field trip into historic Livermore, um, the historic logging village. So we're excited uh, to have Court Hansen leading that program for us. So a couple of, of exciting programs coming up. Um, before I hand things over to David, I do just want to, um, to remind folks um, that it, uh, to go ahead, I think most of you are already muted, but um, if you can go ahead and mute yourself, that way we don't pick up any unintentional background noise. Um, if you have a question for David during the program, the best way to ask that is to type it right into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, if it is an immediate, I will be monitoring that. And if it's an immediate clarifying question, um, I am happy to, to jump in and, um, and ask that of David. Otherwise I will um, hold off and ask those questions of him at the end, at which time um, you are also welcome to, uh, you know, after that unmute yourself and ask questions of, of David directly. Um, and so I will say, you know, as I said, Lori was is very sad to be missing um, this program because it has been on her wish list um, to have a tree ID program for birders, probably born from the you know dozens and dozens of brownfield bog programs, uh, where there's at least someone saying, "See, see that bird in that tree up there?" And you're saying, "Which tree?" And it's <laughs> that one, right? <laughs> right there with the, you know, with the rigid leaves. And so it's, um, you know, being able to, uh, you know, to, to speak more, you know, more accurately um, and also just a great continuing education opportunity um, and, you know, and bringing together two great skills, you know, bird and, bird and tree ID. So you know, our natural choice for this was to, you know, was to ask David Gubatsky and, 
And luckily for us, he was up for the challenge. So David, thank you. I am going to go ahead and hand things over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, Nora. Can you, uh, can you hear me okay? All right, I, I see some nodding heads. Very good. Well, um, it's a pleasure to do this program, Birding by Tree, um, tonight. It's, um, it's a bit of an unusual program, but um, I wanted to, let's just hold on here. There we go. I want to give credit for the idea of birding by tree to a guy by the name of Ken Chaya and his, uh, his buddy, Edward Barnard. There was an article in Audubon magazine back in 2016 and about this, about Ken who prepared a map of Central Park identifying every single tree that is in the park. And it, it, this map is actually sold out a couple of times. And it, it was his philosophy that um, you need to know where the birds are feeding in the trees, you know, what, what kind of trees that particular birds like and that. So I, I give the credit to, uh, to Ken and his uh, colleague, uh, Edward, for, for doing that. So we've got a few objectives tonight. Um, you know, there's there's 1,000 tree species out there in North America. There's just about that many birds, a little less than 1,000 bird species. And so I can't talk about all of them tonight. So we're going to go down to maybe 16 uh, species that really cover 95% of the trees that we have in the Mount Washington Valley area. Um, uh, it's it, that's probably the simplest way to do it. We'll talk a little bit about how to identify birds in trees. We'll have a little quiz for you too. Um, we'll talk about some of the tr native trees and, and shrubs that you can plant in your backyard. I've got some references that I really like to use and let's go ahead and uh, get started here. So uh, I mentioned there's 16 species. I, I picked eight deciduous trees and deciduous by the way means the shed. Um, and conifers, eight conifers, uh, those are cone-bearing trees. And I guess maybe I should mention the word dendrology. Dendrology is an old Greek word, and it means uh, comes from the word dendron or tree, and it means the study of trees. It's a branch of botany. It was perhaps one of my favorite courses in college. Uh, we had a, um, a summer dendrology course and then a, a winter dendrology course. And and obviously, uh, like birds, you, you can't just know everything about them, but it's it's good to know these basics. And if you if you pick these um, eight deciduous and, and eight conifer species, you'll pretty well know most of the um, trees in our area. And some of the references that I really like, this one is Forest Trees of Maine, put out by the Maine Forest Service. Um, the last hard copy was put out in 2008. I'm sure you can still buy it. Um, I know they sell it in Maine. And it's also available free online. You can download the files. And some of the things I really like about it, it has a really great key at the beginning. On if For folks who like to use dichotomous keys, they can identify tree species that way. It has pretty much all of the trees that we have here in New Hampshire. And then it has these comparison charts. As you can see on the right, um, it compares uh, three different kinds of, of birch trees. And there's actually another page with, with another two or three species of birch. So that, that's very, very helpful. And of course, um, uh, Michael Klein um, wrote this book, The Shrubs of uh, Northern New England Forest. And it is an excellent guide. The, the photos are great, but the um, material inside really covers the species that we have. And this book, I believe, is still available at Tin Mountain Conservation Center, and it's definitely worth um, having in, in your library. And then finally, one of the um, easy ways to, to learn about trees is, is this book by uh, Mark Mikolas. Uh, it's on recognizing trees in the Northeast. And it's a beginner's guide, but you know, I actually found some very good information in it, and uh, I think you would enjoy it too. So perhaps you have a copy already at, at the Tin Mountain Library. So how did I get involved in this, um, I guess? Well, you know, aside from being a forester or a silviculturist, uh, for the last 15 years, I've been involved in what's called the Winter 
Finch forecast. And it first started through Ron Pittaway from Ontario, and it's been taken over uh, by Tyler Hoare, also of, of Ontario. And we collect information um, on about a dozen species of trees and shrubs that are found uh, throughout the maritime provinces all the way to the to the western provinces and the northern tier of states. Uh, we cover New England, of course, New York and, and that. And I send my information in in early September and Tyler takes, compiles it with, you know, the three dozen other people with their reports, you know, from Quebec and, um, uh, you know, from Newfoundland and so forth. And we put it together where the shrubs and things are, are having lots of fruit and nuts and, and so forth. And then we come up with a, with a forecast. And so this is the latest forecast here. Um, and there's also some, you know, really interesting ch charts that are out and it gives you, you know, what species like uh, what particular kinds of, of food. And uh, this, again, this will be available uh, if you want to study this chart in more detail or anything else in more detail. Uh, once it's available online, you can, you can do that. Uh, first of all, we should probably define what a tree is and what a shrub is. And, you know, these definitions, you know, they change depending on the area that you're at. But um, I define a tree as a woody perennial plant, typically large, and usually with a single well-developed stem carrying a more or less definite crown. Uh, minimum diameter at breast height, which is four and a half feet of three inches, and a minimum height at maturity of 15 feet. So, I mean, some authorities use 12 feet, some use 20 feet, but uh, that's what I'm going with. So just so you're aware of. And not all trees have a single stem, as you know, you can take basswood or uh, gray birch, for instance, and you could have two, three, four stems coming out. Red maple's another that will grow that way. And then a shrub I define as a woody perennial plant, typically with several stems, usually undefined, and generally less than 15 feet in height. And here's an example of, of a shrub and a tree. Canada U, Texas canadensis, uh, often grows in the understory, and particularly where you don't have moose or deer uh, present in any amount. Uh, and it, it often grows with black spruce, which is that uh, kind of a, a blue-green color in the background. And, and the black spruce can be a tree. And let's take a quick look at the clock method of um, pointing out. And this is obviously going to be a refresher for many of you, but for some of you, you may not know. Um, that if you have a tree, this is uh, sugar maple from uh, a couple of weeks ago in Jefferson here, um, we take a look at the clock and hopefully you have uh, the old fashioned dial clock and, and not one of the digital clocks uh, or watches and or a 24 hour watch. But anyways, uh, 12 o'clock is the top of the tree. Uh, or if you, for instance, if you're in on a, on a canoe, um, or a boat or uh, bicycling even, you can give these directions out. Or you're in a car, um, say, take a look at, uh, you know, there's a pelican at three o'clock. So that would be off to the right side. Uh, 12 o'clock is, is, uh, is straight ahead. Uh, bottom of the tree is six o'clock, of course, and, uh, and that. And you might identify it more saying that it's in the center or upper two thirds of the tree. Uh, and so forth. So let's actually take a quiz. I've got I've got two birds here. One is a rusty blackbird. Now it's my rendition of a rusty blackbird um, on on a tree. Um, it's in black. And then I have a snowy owl, odd place for it on that on that white pine. Uh, in the chat, if you'd like to, um, you know, just write what your uh, answer is, um, and maybe Nora could, could take a look at that. And, and the way we try to define it, um, you know, we try not to use, oh, it's, it's over in that tree because there's so many trees, or it's in the green tree. Most of them are green. But, you know, you might be able to say that it's um, in a particular kind of tree, how close it is to the shore, um, and so forth. So uh, go ahead and, and put your answers in the chat, and I'll, I'll continue on. Uh, trees, they provide the basic needs for many, many bird species. Uh, I mean, even some of our ducks, the hooded merganser and the uh, wood duck, uh, 
for instance, are cavity nesting birds. They, they often will nest in trees, uh, but trees often have food. Uh, for instance, insects are attracted to the leaves, uh, potentially to the stem of the tree, to the fruit. Uh, trees have seeds, fruit, nuts, buds that are all eaten by birds and, and sap. And sap is a major you know, source of food for a number of species, including birds that we typically wouldn't think of, um, such as cedar and bohemian waxwings and, and hummingbirds too. And water, water can uh, collect on, on leaves and those drops of water are what birds can drink and they can actually keep clean by rubbing up against those leaves. And obviously trees provide shelter, protection from the weather and protection from predators um, where they can uh, maintain their thermal balance. And of course, nesting sites. Cavities are really important for many species and, and branches also provide nesting sites. And I, you know, I could mention perches and other things that are important for, for some species. So let's start off with the Eastern white pine. And um, it's probably an important tree. It's a state tree of Maine. Um, little history on that. It, it was you know, really one of the causes of our war for independence. Uh, uh, the English crown had uh, prescribed that white pines that were uh, 24 inches in diameter and at least 72 feet tall that were within three miles of a navigable river where they could float it down had to have uh, had to be reserved for the uh, for the Royal Navy and this was the broad arrow policy that was uh, was chosen and so that was not a keen thing for our our uh, early settlers in, in Maine or New Hampshire uh, where that occurred. So Eastern white pine, it's, um, it's got five needles on um, one little fascicle. Uh, the trees can get to be quite large. The tree on the left is um, in the forestry term, it's called a super canopy tree. It's, it's well above the canopy of the other trees. And it's often a place where uh, eagles and other raptors will perch because they, they get a pretty good view of what's going on in the neighborhood. Uh, the trees I, I've seen, I think the biggest uh, white pine I've seen is 58 inches in diameter. And that's, uh, that's down in the Tamworth area. And that's about 160 feet tall. There's, I, I know they go up to 180 feet uh, down in the Berkshires and Massachusetts. The tree I have uh, on the right, it's actually uh, two stems there. Uh, that was 48 inches in diameter and it's about a hundred feet tall. So pretty big tree, grown on, grown on a rock base too at Pondicherry. So uh, pretty fascinating. Um, next tree that's on our list and, and balsam fir, at least if you're up in Coas County, about 12% of our trees in Coas County are, are balsam fir. Uh, it's the one tree, if you ever read, um, um, oh, the book, I'm trying to think, it's a, a country of the pointed firs. Um, you can remember uh, these trees because they really are pointed. Um, and if you go out west, the subalpine fir and, and a number of these other true firs do have these pointed tops. You know, a couple of these, you can see they're, they're reddish. Uh, that's because we have a balsam woolly adelgid problem that's affecting those trees. Uh, one key thing on identifying them is that the cones of the balsam fir are always upright. They stand up, whereas spruce cones, pine cones, they hang down. So um, that's, a, that's an example of a balsam fir cones. And, and typically every year, this was a blowdown and the, um, the tree actually had a pretty good root structure still. And it was, it was trying to correct itself and, and uh, go towards the sunlight, as you can see here. It's starting to turn upward. And this is an amazing crop of um, balsam fir cones on this particular tree. It's, it's probably trying to put out as many seeds as it can uh, now that it's in a, in a stressed situation. Balsam fir are very similar to the Fraser fir that you uh, find or used to find down on the, the Blue Ridge and in the Great Smokies. They're, they're somewhat related. Another tree, I don't have it on the list because this is not a native, although I, I do know that it does reproduce uh, in the area. I, it's just such a good year for uh, Norway spruce that I had to put it in there, uh, particularly red crossbills. They just love these cones. These cones are six to eight inches long and they're just full of um, seeds that are attractive to these birds. <clears throat> but we do have uh, 
three other kinds of native um, spruce and um, white spruce is what we have typically north of the notches is um, what you typically see. And in the mountains, we're seeing red spruce um, and in the very tops of the mountains and in the bogs and swamps, we'll see black spruce. So um, I just happened to pick white spruce for this uh, presentation. Uh, you can see that um, these cones, it takes it's just one year for them to mature. Uh, they start off as just, you know, fertilized female cones. And by August, they're pretty large cones. They're about three quarters to an inch long, uh, produce a lot of seeds. And by October, they mature. So what I'm doing when I go out to do surveys for trees, I, I have these established locations where from year to year, I'm able to, to sample what kind of uh, of a cone crop that we have. And so it was a, it was a pretty good cone crop. I mean, it wasn't exceptional this year, um, but as you can see, there's some, there are some pretty good uh, cones on that tree. Now trees, um, and these are some of the trees that I uh, have to survey for. They have what we call mast years, years that produce these exceptional crops of uh, seeds or nuts or fruit. Uh, for black spruce, it's typically every two to four years, but you're gonna get some kind of a crop every year. Uh, but it takes until they're generally about 30 years of, of age before they can really start producing. And, and they ripen between August and September. Uh, white spruce, you get a good crop every two to six years and, and so forth. Uh, larch this year wasn't a particularly great crop. I only rated it fair. Um, have to be 40 years old before you get a good crop. Um, whereas you go down to, to uh, white birch, it's, it's typically every other year. And not only do we have white birch in, in our valleys up to about 3,000 feet, we have a uh, heartleaf birch or mountain paper birch, it's called, Betula cordifolia, and that actually seems to be on an alternate basis. So if you don't have white birch seeds or catkins in the valleys, you may have them higher up in the mountains. Uh, crab apples, typically annual, although some species don't produce fruit. They're, they've been, you know, uh, made so that they, um, uh, nurtured so they only produce the flowers and, and very, very little fruit. So that's not something you'd want to buy. I, I'm not a keen uh, person to recommend uh, buying cultivars of any species. Just go with the native species. Uh, box elder, which is a type of maple that has an annual production, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And it starts pretty young at, at 15 years of age. So black spruce typically found either in bogs uh, or on mountaintops because the conditions are very, very similar. Um, it's a tree that uh, can live pretty long. Uh, the cones, small cones, but they're very attractive to crossbills. And crossbills are really, a, a, I should say white wing crossbills are a spruce specialist. So they're, they're around, I'm seeing white wing crossbills and red crossbills in the last uh, few days in both the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont and around here. Uh, they can produce an exceptional cone crop. I've actually seen so many cones, green cones on a tree that it breaks the top of the tree off and they have to form a new leader. So uh, occasionally you'll see these fork top trees because so many cones have been produced. And that's, that's really what the um, crossbills like. When, when their scouts are out finding you know, lots of cones, you seem to have a lot of birds coming in and they can actually nest at any, any month of the year. One of the interesting things about black spruce is it often uh, reproduces by layering. And that's, uh, it looks a little bit like a giant donut here. That's where the original tree was. <clears throat> but as the branches would get down and they would be covered with moss, the branches would actually form into trees and, and, and grow. This was up on Mount Clinton. Uh, black spruce, if you look at the twigs on a, on a uh, branch that's, uh, you know, at least in the fall, it'll have that blackish appearance uh, right along here. So that's why they get their name. Now, a red spruce has longer needles and a white spruce has even longer needles. It's the longest. And again, the cones are the same. White spruce has the biggest cones. Black spruce has the smallest cones. And some of the birds that love to be in a black spruce forest, they're 
they're somewhat dependent on, on that. And, and the palm warbler is one. Uh, this is from the summer at, at Pondicherry. There's, there's about uh, 40 pairs of them um, in the uh, black spruce forest. And occasionally you'll come across uh, species like this, the uh, a male spruce grass. And this is pretty much a black spruce dependent bird. It, it will eat tamarack needles in the month of September and a little bit into October. It eats blueberries and, and some insects, but it really likes to have young black spruce needles to eat. So uh, it's interesting to, to see their scat. It's just a, a, like sawdust uh, with uh, spruce needles in it. <clears throat> Another uh, species uh, that are of interest to, to many birders so you wouldn't want to go to, um, uh, to a hardwood forest, the birch forest, to look for black-backed woodpeckers. You'd want to go to a forest that has black spruce. And, and these black-backed woodpeckers, they're really adapted for flecking off the bark of spruce and to a lesser extent, fur, looking for um, uh, bark beetles and, and thing like, things like that. I saw a couple yesterday. They're just always a a great sight to see. Uh, these birds only have three toes. Most, most of the birds uh, around have, have four toes. So these are tridactyl birds. There's a related species called a uh, three-toed woodpecker, uh, but this is the black-backed woodpecker. We don't see too many three-toed woodpeckers in New Hampshire. Also in this uh, boreal spruce forest, you, you can find boreal chickadees. And chickadees uh, like this, the brown cat, um, you can find them above 3,000 feet, or you can find them in the valleys if, if you have a black spruce forest, because they, they really are kind of adapted to the, that type of a, of a community. Um, certainly white wing crossbills um, are going to be around this winter. I don't know in, in what numbers, but we're certainly seeing them at, the, at their usual haunts. Now, white wing crossbills have a fairly small uh, bill compared to um, compared to the red red cross bill. so so they tend to do a lot better uh, feeding on the uh, spruce and tamarack cones where they get their seeds. Uh, it's interesting, you know the the lower bill, you may know this, but uh, the researchers have determined that seventy five percent of them have a uh, the lower bill curves to the right. Uh, the other 25% curve to the left, whereas the next bird, which is the red cross bill, the lower bill is uh, about 50-50. So sometimes it's the left, sometimes it's the right. That's not going to be a quiz question, but uh, this is the red cross bill, and we saw a lot of them last winter. Uh, they have a really, really big bill, and, and they're really, I mean, there's 10 different subtypes that we know of. And they've been kind of adapted. It's this evolutionary race between the pine cones and, and the crossbills to, uh, to adapt. And so I think that's why some of the trees have, have changed. And so some of the birds have evolved with different kinds of bills. So we have 10 different subspecies and there's actually a, a, a genuine species in addition to the uh, red crossbill that's found out in Idaho now that was just designated. So large bills, Beautiful color, um, and and uh, typically they're in pines. They will go for um, for white spruce cones, black spruce cones too. But uh, if you want to be looking for them, try to find them uh, in a pine forest. And a lot of these birds, they have a real craving for salt. I think it might be like some people who have a craving for potato chips. But uh, this was up in Pittsburgh last year on the Christmas bird count, and there was some road salt. And, and that's why you sometimes see uh, along highways, numbers of these crossbills that have been hit by cars. They aren't fast enough to get out of the way. And the pine grosbeak, one of my favorite birds. That is uh, what we call a frugivore. Uh, it's a species that really loves to have um, fruit as part of its diet. If you had to plant one tree in your backyard for birds, I would suggest that the crab apple is the choice because typically you get these uh, great crops of crab apples every fall. And then you have beautiful color uh, with the flowers. And of course you have uh, lots of um, shade from these particular trees. 
And of course, the Canadians liked it so much that they, they made a, a bill, a thousand dollar bill. Um, I don't have any, some of you may have a couple of them, but uh, I understand that you know, they haven't printed them for like 30 years. There was something about counterfeiting them or whatever, but uh, it, you can still buy them, uh, I think on eBay and places like that. So uh, this was a pine gross beak that uh, was in our yard last fall. It was November 15th. I just happened to check the date on the photograph. So big chunky bird. Uh, I mean, it could be in any of the forest here, they'll, they love to eat buds, uh, but fruit is their, is their specialty. So you want to look for places that have lots of crab apples. And one of the famous places is in Gorham, New Hampshire. Uh, whoever was planting trees in Gorham, they planted a lot of crab apples. So we get people from all over the country coming up to Gorham in the wintertime when the reports are coming in that there's crab apples. And funny incident last year, it was, uh, well, it was after the January 6th incident at the uh, Capitol building, um, it was maybe a week later. And there were a bunch of people in there and they had these large cameras and they had a uh, camouflage on, which is, you know, a lot of birders like to wear camouflage. And they're walking down the street in this, uh, woman in, in uh, Gorham called the police on these people. One of my friends got uh, picked up by the police and they were just laughing about it, but uh, it made the newspaper and actually made a lot of the uh, national news stories. So anyways, that's the story about crab apples. So come to Gorham in the wintertime, you've got them in Conway too. Um, and, and so just kind of stake out where they are and keep an eye on, on them because they're gonna be coming. They seem to work their way further south and um, Bohemian waxwings, um, eruptive species, it's spelled IRR as opposed to a volcano eruption, but it, it means that these are wandering birds and they are looking for food and, and particularly fruit. A friend, Len Medlock, uh, took a picture of these um, Bohemian waxwings. So they like to actually feed on the ground. I, I see Bohemian waxwings feeding a lot on the ground. Um, so crab apple trees, try to stake out where they are and, uh, and you know, go out of your way, you know, every now and then in, in uh, December and see if they're around or watch the uh, bird net. Uh, cedar waxwings, uh, you know, they look somewhat similar, but they're smaller and they don't have that uh, rusty brown undertail covert. They're, they're named cedar waxwings because they eat cedar berries, which is, they, it's really not a, cedar, it's a juniper, it's a Juniperus virginiana or Eastern red cedar. And we do have some uh, red cedar in the Mount Washington Valley. It's not real common. And in fact, the northernmost red cedar is on White Ledge in Bartlett. It's up on a cliffside. Uh, that was an interesting uh, visit to see that particular stand of red cedar. But they put these, these berries out and uh, no, you can't make gin out of this particular berry here, but they, they do love uh, this. Another bird that we occasionally get here in New Hampshire is Townsend's solitaire. And, and it, again, it's an accidental, it's a species that's way out. But if there's any of these cedar uh, berries, which it's actually a kind of a, a cone, uh, the seed, uh, they may be there. So, uh, so be alert to uh, red cedar that are, that are fruiting like this. And we have a lot of American robins that are here. And, and we actually have some robins that are uh, the subspecies called the um, Newfoundland robin or the black-backed robin. Um, and and there we have some crab apple trees here and flocks of these robins are descending on them. We also have rough grouse and the rough grouse seem to come in right at dusk and they spend about a half an hour in the trees. We have you know several of them in a tree at one time. So it's interesting to see these rough grouse that are leaping up and grabbing a crab apple and eating it. So lots of robins, you may be seeing them in your yard too. So uh, another reason to plant, these birds are, they're migrating and so they're looking for food. Uh, staghorn sumac is a, another favorite food of, uh, of birds, including robins and even cardinals and, and juncos uh, and other species that uh, it's not the, most desired food, but come February, if, if the staghorn sumac fruit is still out there, they're gonna be feeding on it. So lovely to see. Um, 
And if I had a second choice for a species to plant in my yard, it would be mountain ash. Uh, usually there's some crop every year, but it's usually every two years. And this year there's a pretty good crop of uh, the wild mountain ash. And these species can, can live up in the mountains. Uh, oh, I've seen them at 4,000 feet and, and going for a hike in, in March, uh, say on the Crawford path, uh, you hear robins everywhere and it's March, you say spring is coming early, but no, it's because that there's food there and, and it's not the cold that bothers them, it's the lack of food. So they love to have mountain ash. So another tree to consider planting. You can, there is one, you can get a uh, European mountain ash. And it's one of the few non-native species that is, is well liked by uh, other birds. And, and I approve of it uh, for that matter. Uh, winterberry holly is uh, certainly out in, in good numbers. These are from a couple of days ago at Pondicherry, these, these red berries. Um, uh, don't eat them yourself. Um, they were used in the olden times to cause you to, to vomit. Um, so unless you need to vomit, I suppose you could eat a few then, but I don't recommend it. So robins really love these and hermit thrush. Um, Catbirds will, will eat this. And so they're... Uh, definitely being devoured. So winterberry holly, Ilex verticillata. Um, this is more of a September fruit, elderberry. Uh, there's an American black elderberry than a red elder. Uh, either one, you know, plant them because they, they ripen at, at different times of the year. And of course, uh, choke cherry, and there's also a choke berry. Uh, again, uh, cedar waxwings just love these. Uh, cat birds will, will be feeding on them and robins. And highbush cranberry, viburnum trilobal. Uh, that's another one that you might want to plant. Uh, I would say, you know, get four or five from the state forest nursery and plant them together in a bunch. Uh, that's the best way as opposed to just planting individuals. Uh, they seem to really thrive where there's several stems that are coming up. I've seen rough grouse feeding on them, not a high sugar content, so birds typically don't eat them until later on in the year, but uh, they, will, they will eat them. Uh, mountain holly. Uh, 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 this is a species that's typically found the, along our bogs and also along our mountainsides. Uh, this tends to um, come out in September, and it seems to be a, a prize food for a lot of the birds. And I've even seen yellow rump warblers uh, uh, working on, on these. And of course, our wild raisin. Uh, they start off kind of a whitish a berry and then green, and then they turn a pink and a red, and then finally they get really this purple color. And it looks like a wild raisin, but there's a lot of sugar value, food value in this particular uh, plant. So uh, that's something you can buy from the state forest nursery. Also, you can transplant it, or you can even try growing them from seeds too. So let's take a look at some of the birds that uh, also like to eat these things. This is, of course is the evening grosbeak and, and this is a male and I, I really like it. It's kind of like it's got a Viking horns coming out here that uh, go in the back here and, uh, and gross is a, a French word meaning large and so it certainly does have a large, large bill. If you probably, if you had some this last winter and spring, you'll know that their, their bills turn this kind of a mint green color in the spring and a uh, large bird. And uh, if you ever try to uh, band one of these things and it gets on your finger there, they can, they can do some real damage. Uh, but uh, gorgeous bird, they come in flocks um, and they like maple seeds. And, and here's a, another idea. I just wanna throw out some hints on how to identify different kinds of trees. And, and one of the techniques I can use is, uh, and you probably can too, is, is the color. Uh, red maples often will start turning scarlet in the end of August and September. And those are often our, what we call our swamp maples. Um, and that's because they, there's some anthocyanin. It's a type of uh, sugar that's being trapped when the, uh, uh, when the on, the, on the petiole of the leaf, you get this corky layer called an abscission layer developing and it traps the sugars in there. And so you get this really brilliant uh, scarlet color here. As you can see here, the difference on the red maple and the sugar maple, and this area in here is called a sinus. 
it is a V shape on the red maple, whereas on the sugar maple, it's more of a U shape that you see here. And the sugar maples typically have more of a orange color mixture with, uh, with the reds and, and the yellows. And that's because it has um, some of the carotenoid pigments and xanthophyll pigments that are, that are found in there. So both uh, wonderful trees and, and, and they produce seeds at uh, different times of the year. So we have several species of uh, uh, maples around and, and one of my favorites, and it's not a favorite of very many people because the wood isn't that valued commercially, but it's the box elder. Box elder, the uh, scientific name Acer Nagundo, uh, put its, out a prolific number of seeds that um, particularly evening grosbeaks beaks like it, but rose-breasted grosbeaks beaks will, will like it too. And of course, um, that's in September. Uh, the silver maple, that actually tends to ripen in May. And that's just an adaptation to living on floodplains where um, you want to have these, these spring floods. They bring a lot of silt. And so these trees have evolved so that they produce most of their seeds in April and May, and they drop them on this nice alluvial mixture of mud so that they can re reproduce that way. And incidentally, these, uh, these seeds are actually edible. Of course, you got to get rid of the, uh, I don't know, you call it a helicopter or whirly gig. It's a technical term is a samara on these, but uh, the seeds are actually edible of, um, on, on maples. So favorites of, of grosbeaks. Well, let's talk about two more of our species that we, we have in pretty good numbers. Uh, we have the paper birch, Betula papyrifera. Um, and that species is our state tree. Um, typically comes in, in open areas after a forest fire, after uh, a logging operation and on some of the better soils. Uh, but the key thing is that it readily peels. And, and that's an adaptation so that it doesn't build up a, a lot of dirt and grime and fungus uh, where you end up having in the springtime that the, the sun will shine on that dark bark and it'll cause sap to flow up and then it'll get cold at night and it'll cause frost cracks. And so uh, that's why it typically sheds its bark. And you'll, you'll find this all the way up into the tree line in, in the Arctic. Um, on the right side, you can see um, this is a gray birch and it's got these triangles or what are called mustaches. And that actually comes from a fungus uh, that you have here. Let's see, Pseudospiropes uh, longipilis uh, fungus. Uh, but the key things, the bark, if, if you rub it, it's very chalky, very little peeling, and it's kind of a dirty gray. And these things, these, these little lines here, the, these are called lenticels. And that's where gas exchange occurs. And they're often really, really dark. Uh, so um, it'll also grow in clumps um, and they don't live very long. They'll live 50 to 75 years. Whereas on a paper birch, you could have a paper birch living for 240, 250 years. There's an example. There's a 32 inch diameter white birch, paper birch um, at, at Pondicherry. It's, it's a huge tree. It's hard to even tell what kind of a tree it is, uh, but if you look at the leaves and if you look at the bark closely in, in various areas, particularly on the limbs, you'll see that it's quite, um, quite white. Um, here's an unusual white birch that I happened to see a few weeks ago. It is a white birch, but it has these really raised lenticels. And lenticels, just um, particularly on, on birch and cherry trees, it's one way of identifying the trees. And, and the function of these lenticels is to allow a gas exchange. Uh, as you know, trees um, through photosynthesis, they, um, they can produce oxygen. They take carbon dioxide out of the air. So there's some gas exchange going on here. They, they definitely need to have them. And some of our um, other birches, there's, there's black birch. I, I don't know if there's any of them out Washington Valley. I know further in the uh, Concord area, there's certainly plenty of black birch there, but this is yellow birch, sometimes called silver birch or gold birch. Uh, this is a younger tree. This is probably a, about a 50 year old tree. And this tree here is, was in the Intervale area. It's in the 
near uh, Mountain Pond. There's a candidate research natural area near Mountain Pond, just upslope. And this tree was about 37, 38 inches in diameter. It's huge. That's my Biltmore stick here. It looks like a yard stick here, but that's I, I can roughly get the diameter of the tree by holding that up against the tree at four and a half feet up. And that's a huge tree. It's an old tree. I, you know, it's two, 250 years is, uh, is my guess. And, and I don't know if that forest was, was ever cut uh, on uh, at Mountain Pond above the, uh, above the pond, but beautiful forest. I, I'd love to take you out there on, a, on an old growth forest hike sometime. Maybe next year we can do that. So um, where I'm getting at on this is that uh, the birch trees and, and their relatives, the alders, produce catkins. And they're really the favorites of uh, our common red poles, hoary red poles, and pine siskins. And, and I'm seeing pine siskins moving in. I uh, saw a flock of 15 the other day. And these are the little catkins here and this on the yellow birch. On the, on the gray birch and the white birch and the mountain paper birch, they're, they're much longer. And these catkins have a lot of seed. They're really, really high in energy. And one of the adaptations that yellow birch has is that these catkins start to disintegrate in uh, November and December. And so you see the seeds that are on top of the snow. And if the snow has any crust on it, uh, they look like tiny little frog feet. Uh, and if there's any crust, the wind just blows these seeds along the snow. And so they can go to a new area. And that's one of the ways that they adapt. So look for, um, if you don't have feeders out, look, uh, look for these birch catkins, birch stands in particular, and, and alder swamps to look for those red poles and, and the siskins. And here's an example uh, of these two species. They're both specialists. And of course, they do like um, uh, uh, niger thistle, uh, which uh, it's always good to have along. And of course, uh, sunflower seeds, the hull sunflower seeds, they really like having them too. So wonderful birds to have in the wintertime. I'm looking forward to seeing, seeing more of them. Uh, another species on my list of 16 is uh, the American beech. And here's just a couple ways that you might be able to tell at this time of the year. They, they have a, a lovely green colored leaf in the, in the summertime, but at this time of the year, um, these aren't pigments. It's kind of a metabolic waste product. It's called tannin. The leaves go from green to yellow to brown. And on the younger trees, and this is also true of uh, oak trees and, and chestnut trees, the, uh, the leaves will stay on the, on the uh, actual tree. When they get older, they, they tend to fall off. And that process, is, it's called a marcescent leaf. Uh, this is more likely what you're going to be seeing, these particular stems. And you know, 10, 15 years ago, you could go around in the woods like this, this tree on the right here. Uh, well, this one has bear claw marks on it, some recent ones. You can actually age when the bear was up. It's it, when they climb up, they can climb up pretty well. When they're coming down, they often will slide down, and so they leave those claw marks. These these darker ones, these are older. And I actually have a little guidebook on uh, how to uh, age the uh, the claw marks. But anyways, the uh, uh, the stems, the trunks of the trees looked a lot clearer. But now we have a another wave of this beech bark scale disease. And it's an insect that's native insect that bores into the, uh, uh, the trunk of the tree. And then it, there's a, a fungus, a, a nectaria fungus that follows. And that was introduced from uh, Europe, I believe. And it, it causes what looks like this smallpox uh, on these particular beech trees. And so it's, it's not good. Sometimes though, you know, I, I've seen trees are able to resist it. Um, and they produce lots of beech nuts. And beech nuts uh, are a favorite of, of some species of birds, particularly turkeys. Uh, so you'll have turkeys going underneath a beech tree. They'll do the same thing with uh, oak trees looking for, looking for acorns. All right, so uh, we're nearing the, uh, the end here. I wanted to talk a little bit about yellow-bellied sapsuckers and what they do. Um, if you're out in a, in a forest and there's some aspen trees around in, uh, in late April, when they start coming in in May, look and listen, because 
the uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker typically likes to use aspen uh, trees, particularly that have that uh, uh, these these cankers, Fulmus uh, igniarius uh, fungus cankers, because they're somewhat hollow. They're fairly easy to go through. So that's often where they will, they will put their cavity in, often under a branch or underneath one of these, these cankers. And yellow-bellied sap sectors, as you probably know, they love trees to drum on. They'll do street signs, they'll do uh, metal siding on your house, and they'll go back and keep doing it. And it drives people crazy, but uh, they're just trying to attract a mate and also to display their, their territory. Uh, sap suckers, you know, they get their name uh, not because they suck the sap, they actually lap it up. They have a, a tongue adaptation where they can uh, lap up the sap. And, and there's many, many trees. There's probably several hundred species of trees. You know, you'll see them on hemlock trees. You'll see them on uh, white birch, uh, certainly uh, maple trees, apple trees that they will... will um, leave their uh, their drill holes and they actually leave two different kinds of, of holes and if if you're an observer of nature and you you get out take a look and look for these round holes which typically are quite deep they those typically go in the trunk of the trees and at the beginning of the year and they don't restore them but the the other ones um, the rectangular ones they keep those open they're called wells and these are places where um, they can go back, they can lap up the sap, but uh, just as important, they can get insects. I see a fly right over here. Uh, uh, and this is a hummingbird. Hummingbirds go, they're, they're kind of associates of yellow-bellied sap suckers at these, at these wells. So um, once they'll open it up and, and you could potentially have a tree that will die because they've, uh, put these sap sucker wells all the way around the tree and it's it's girdled the tree but uh, they try to keep it open and um, and you'll also get this what's called black bark fungus on sugar maple trees and uh, and red maple trees it's just that sugar which tends to get a fungus uh, growing on it so kind of neat I really like sap suckers uh, they have a you know distinct drumming and a distinct call and uh, I think it's really the only true migratory um, woodpecker that we have. You know, we get flickers that uh, migrate shorter distances, but uh, yellow-bellied sapsuckers, they, they travel a long distance to get out. And of course, if you're out birding in the woods, you know, snags and, and woodpeckers, like uh, this pileated woodpecker, they go hand in hand. And it's important to leave snags out in the woods. And of course, you know, you have to make a decision if you have a hiking trail or a picnic table underneath the snag, you may want to remove that and just, just leave it on the ground because it will still be of use, uh, but for safety purposes. But out in the woods, more snags, the better. There's life and dead trees. And then if you're looking for winter wrens, one of the best places is to look at these tip-up mounds. The tip-up mounds are, are often places where winter wrens will um, will nest. You know, it's just like brown creepers. They'll often uh, find a tree that has some loose bark and they'll nest between the bark and the, and the tree. But winter wrens just love these uh, particular um, tip up mounds here. And of course, uh, you know, being able to describe uh, where this northern hawk owl is and uh, you've got a lot of trees on the horizon and, and, and being able to identify that it's in a uh, 12 o'clock in a balsam fir uh, or at nine o'clock and say 200 yards out. That's, that's really important, I think, for, for birders. And so it's, it's really important uh, to try to pick up the skills to, to be able to identify a tree. So you can tell your, uh, the person you're with that it's in a white pine or it's in a uh, uh, sugar maple or some other kind of a tree or a shrub. And it's, it's also important to, you know, look at their behavior, their habitat. And for myself, you know, I enjoy seeing birds. I enjoy uh, looking at them, but I'm often trying to see what are they eating? You know, what's this warbler? What kind of a uh, caterpillar is it feeding on? So those are the things that I'm trying to, uh, to pick up. So I'd like to thank you here. I think I finished just about on time and I will, um, 
see if anyone is, uh, has any, any questions. All right. Thank you, David, so much. I like your fancy little <laughs> call at the end. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, I think at this point, the only questions that were the only chat pieces that came through were, um, were part of your little quiz. So I don't know if anyone has um, a question for David. If you want, you can either type it right into the chat feature or um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself now um, if you'd like to ask that of him. And I, I did have a um, an ID list that I sent to uh, to Nora, and um, I don't know Nora if you want to send out or make it available on the mm -hmm. website. Yes, yeah. I can certainly, um, and folks or folks can um, can email me, um, and I will will go ahead and share that with you with them. Nobody wants to play the game stump the chump. I know. <laughs> All right, Mike. What's I've, your... I've got a, I've got a question. <laughs> okay, Mike. <laughs> I um, uh, so you talked about eastern red cedar, um, and it's a gymnosperm, right? It's a non-true flowering plant. So it, but when you look at the seed, like that thing looks a lot like a berry, but that's not that's not a berry, right? That what what is it? It's, it, it's a it's a uh, form of a cone actually, um, that if you look at it really close, it, there's a, actually a seed in there. Uh, so it's in, there, there is a name for it. Um, and I, I'm, I can't think of it right now, but uh, it, it is edible, the entire thing. Um, and, and birds do, birds do like it. Okay. Cause yeah, when you, when you, you know, pick it off, it feels like a fruit. I mean, it feels like a flesh. Yeah, right. Right. So yeah, just, and that's you, always confused me. It, it is a juniper, and um, as opposed to a, a northern white cedar, which actually has cones, which are you know favorite of uh, uh, siskins and and actually uh, white winged crossbills, or the Atlantic white cedar, which uh, which also has cones too. So, but uh, it's not a uh, those aren't junipers. Yeah. Uh, Anyone else? My gosh, you've just oh, <laughs> they're over wow. with too much information. <laughs> well, in, in talking with Nora, we should know um, tomorrow what the forecast is for our uh, planned field trip on Saturday. It's not looking good. There's a lot of rain moving oh. through, and we want to we want to be uh, be safe. <laughs> So we'll let you know hey, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a noise back there, Nora. <laughs> yes, that's just light. Yes, that is life continuing in my. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> in my background, well, David, thank you so much for um, for this presentation and pulling it together, and um, we will keep folks posted on uh, on the field trip scheduled for Saturday, and hopefully find. Um, another time to reschedule if we have to have to call it. Okay. Uh, thanks, Nora. And if anyone has questions, they can email them to me also. Um, 